In this video, we're going to continue our conversation about the persuasive process, specifically by talking about content premises. This is the second of our third uh, videos on, on the persuasive process. So if you missed the first one on the tools of motivation, you might want to go back and check that out. But just to get us started, um, I want to lay a little foundation here because all of these persuasive processes really go back to what we call enthymematic persuasion and thematic per persuasion. So I just want to review real, really quickly. If you've missed that first video, or if it's been a bit since you've watched it, what is enthymematic persuasion? Well, first of all, it, it was really developed by our, our pal Aristotle all the way back uh, with Aristotle uh, who kind of looked at syllogism, which said, you know, there's a major premise and then a minor premise and a conclusion. And he looked at that and said, you know, for persuasion, that may not be the best method. Let, let's try something a little different here. Let's not use syllogism. Let's, let's just assume that the audience, uh, um, we'll make a connection here and leave that major premise unstated. Let's not state it. Let's let the audience come to that conclusion. The audience will supply that major premise. It's our job as a persuader <clears throat> then to identify the common ground that comes along with that major premise that we're both just on the same page with. I don't have to say it. You know what I'm talking about, right? And so that's our major premise. And, uh, and, and that's what Aristotle was saying. We don't have to say the major premise. We'll leave that unstated. We're all on the same page. Let's just jump right in um, with some other things. And so the persuader then though has to be very specific in identifying that common ground to make sure that we're on the same page as the audience. And we know where we're starting from. This really encourages the co-creation of meaning between the audience and the, the persuader and gives you that kind of step up already. We're on the same page already. We're working together. Our minds are working as one. So kind of makes that connection for us, right? Encourages that co-creation of meaning between the persuader and the audience. So for our purposes, again, we're breaking this down into three different areas. There are three different ways that we go about using this enthymematic persuasion. Um, the one we talked about in the first video was process. We use that, you know, kind of the psychological aspects, the psychological factors of persuasion in connecting with the audience. That was our process premise. Uh, this video is going to focus on the content premise, which has more to do with the logical or rational uh, patterns of persuasion. Then uh, the other video that we're getting, that will be the third in this series is going to be on cultural premises, right? So um, that are that the cultural premises that are, uh, that are rooted in the values, the beliefs and the behaviors passed down by that culture or society. Then, okay? So in this video though, we're going to focus on the content premises. So, just to cover a few principles of this content premises. Um, first of all, it does, again, as we've mentioned, operate in the enthymematic persuasion realm of enthymematic persuasion here. This is this content promises. These content premises are part of that enthymematic persuasion. They also rely on logical or, and or analytical abilities of the audience, the ability uh, of the audience to understand and to make those logical connections and to be persuaded by those logical connections and, and use their analytical abilities to do so. Uh, sometimes the content premises are called arguments or propositions or offers or whatever, but it all really comes back to um, those logical elements of persuasion. Um, so just to clarify a little bit more and connect to the last video in the tools of motivation, we talked about the psychological process. We talked a lot about how that related to the, the peripheral route, for example, in the elaboration likelihood model, we mentioned that it was the low involvement process processing, um, usually reserved for, I don't want to say necessarily less important, but we're talking here about, you know, what kind of candy bar should I get? Not what house should I buy now in, in the content premises, we're getting into the high involvement processing that deals with things like where should I buy this house or not? What should I look for in a car that I buy? These are major or, you know, who should I marry? Who should I date? These types of things are the, in the high involvement processing arena in the evaluation likelihood model. And those are the types of things we're going to be getting into with these content premises, as opposed to the low involvement processing that we talked about in the psychological uh, premises, the, the, uh, the tools of motivation that we talked about in the first video. So when we talk about content premises, we need to talk about proof. We need to talk about proof because that's what the audience is looking for, for these logical uh, elements. They want proof. They want to, to know for sure what it is you're saying. They want evidence of that, right? So, so we need to understand, first of all, that the effectiveness of proof varies from uh, due to a variety of factors. The effectiveness of proof will not be stable from one situation or one person to the other. So 
we need to consider how this proof, the effectiveness of this proof will vary from situation to situation. Right? So just to take an example, uh, one popular topic here lately has been the legalization of marijuana. Some states have done it, some states haven't. So it's been a hot topic uh, for several years now. We need to understand that if we're trying to persuade about the legalization of marijuana, whether or not it should be, let's just say for, for the sake of argument that we're arguing that it should be legalized, right? That it should be legalized in whatever state where we're at. We need to understand that the situation we're in will impact how uh, people perceive that, that, that logic and whether it makes sense or not, right? If we're making this argument at, you know, at a fraternity house, then that might be different than making this argument at a uh, Sunday school classroom, right? Those are going to be two different situations or even at the rotary, which is, you know, you know, made up of, of business leaders and, and social leaders from the community. Um, that have a different perspective on these things. So the situation is going to impact how the audience uh, perceives that and how that persuasion is perceived and how effective it is. Right. We also have to consider the persons involved, right? Who are the persons involved? Again, we, we can look at demographics. We can look at age. We can look at sex. We can look at, you know, uh, employment, socioeconomic um, factors in determining, you know, how this particular person or this audience might perceive our argument and the effectiveness of that proof. Um, some, Audiences are going to be more likely to take evidence from particular people or situations and, and believe that more strongly than than other audiences might. So we need to consider the persons and, and understand that the effectiveness of that proof will vary from person to person. And then finally, topic to topic. Um, obviously, people care about different things. Some people are going to feel strongly on one side of this argument or the other. Maybe may feel strongly that marijuana should be legalized or may feel strongly that it should not be legalized. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of people in the middle who just don't care or don't know or don't, you know, don't have an opinion on this particular topic. So we need to understand that that the effectiveness of, of proof is going to vary from topic to topic as well. So effectiveness of proof is going to, to vary. We also need to understand that there are different components of proof, right? Two primary components. When we look at logos, when we look at logical appeals, we look at proof, we look at, you know, these, these rational appeals for uh, persuasion. There are really two things that are involved. The first is evidence. Can you prove it? Can you prove it? Do you have the evidence to back it up? Okay. So that's, that's one aspect of it. The other then is reasoning. So we look at evidence and reasoning. Reasoning then has to do with, can we make that connection between the evidence and what it is we're talking about and between the evidence and what it is the audience wants to hear or what they want to know or what they already know about, right? So we need to consider um, the evidence that we have, the proof that we have, and then the reasoning. Can we make that connection between those things and between that audience and so forth? So when we look at logical uh, persuasion, when we look at logos, we're, we're concerned with evidence and reasoning. So we're going to talk about each of those things uh, in greater depth here. First, let's take a look at the evidence by examining the different types of evidence uh, that we can have, different types of evidence. Uh, the first category that we have is what we call dramatic evidence. Um, by dramatic, we don't mean like cinematic and, oh, you know, this, you know the, 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 the drama of life and things like that, not, not the drama of reality TV. We're talking about drama in the sense of, for example, telling a story. I mean, we are, we are storytelling creatures by nature, right? We are compelled by stories. We are persuaded by stories and so forth. So dramatic evidence has to do with telling that story or somehow uh, conveying that story to the audience. So we take a look at things like narratives, right? Again, we are narrative creatures. We love stories. We love to be involved. So narratives are these longer form stories that we have, um, where we tell you know, evidence, we provide evidence through the use of storytelling. We tell elaborate and, and involved uh, stories that engage the audience and, and help them understand what it is we're talking about and why we're trying to persuade them of that and so forth, the benefits of all that. So it all comes to fruition through these kind of longer form stories that we can tell. That's what we mean by narratives, right? We also have anecdotes, which are kind of the same thing, except they're shorter. Anecdotes are just little stories, little jokes, little, you know, three or four sentences, and they're very powerful. They're very compelling. Uh, you know that, that you can, uh, you can tell when somebody knows how to tell a story. Right. You can you can tell when somebody knows how to tell an anecdote. Um, one famous example uh, of this in both both arenas, really narratives and anecdotes would be um, President Reagan. Ronald Reagan was a great storyteller. And part of that comes from his personality. But a part of it comes from the fact that he was a prof professional actor. He knew how to do these, deliver these things. And that's why he was called the great communicator. Right. But he, he had all these stories, you know, notebooks and note cards and things that he kept around 
uh, that, that people are still discovering in his presidential library, these little stashes of, of stories and things that he would drop into speeches and drop in when he was communicating with people because he knew that people were narrative creatures. He had all these kinds of little stories and jokes that he would slip in there uh, because they're very powerful. They're very convincing. And that's what people are compelled by those things there. Okay. So we can, we can provide dramatic evidence through the use of narratives and through the use of evidence. We can also do so through the use of testimony. Right. So when we have an expert in some arena or we have somebody who is that would that would be that would be expert testimony or when we have somebody who's experienced something firsthand, we call that peer testimony. But either way, that's dramatic evidence. That's somebody uh, who has some special knowledge or expertise uh, of that particular topic in that particular arena who is telling us about that thing. And that is compelling to us. That is dramatic evidence that we like to hear it from people who know about it, either because they've studied it and, and have an expertise in that area or because they've lived it and have some personal experience in that area and they can share their story then too. We can also uh, convey and, and engage in, in uh, uh, dramatic evidence through the use of participation participation, right? We can have people engage in that activity themselves and to really understand it and understand what it means. So maybe you've gone, I've been involved with a number of, you know, college fairs and high school fairs and things like that, where, um, where, where the police are there and they bring what they, what they, you know, affectionately call the, the drunk goggles, right? They put these on and it simulates what it is like if you're trying to drive or walk after you've had X amount of drinks, right? So you put these on and it's a fun way for people to kind of, they put them on scooters or they put them on, you know, just have them walk a course and, and they, they film it or they have their friends watch it and talk about how difficult that is, right? They give them that firsthand experience of what that would be like. And it's all fun. And then they say though, these simulations, they say, yeah, that was great. And, and then along the process, you killed three people in a drunk driving accident. Right? And that really drives that, that home, that experience home. When you realize, well, this is not just for, just for fun. It's not just, you know, something that's completely lighthearted. We get people to participate in these things and to, to live these experiences. That's a really compelling way to engage evidence and to, uh, to, uh, engage in persuasion with those people. Then finally, we just have rational evidence. Okay. So no longer into the storytelling and things like that. Now we're really strictly using, uh, logos, things like statistics, things like, you know, this is this, we're using, asking people to use their logical processes. We're laying out this evidence and asking them to, to really consider and think about those things. So those are different types of evidence. We have the dramatic evidence that has more to do with engaging a person's narrative, uh, inherent narrative interests and desires and telling stories and being a part of stories. And then you have rational evidence, which is really just engaging the analytical, logical part of their brain. We also have different types of reasoning. Okay. We, we, the two sides of the same coin here, evidence and reasoning, both important evidence to demonstrate proof and to provide that proof reason to make the connections between that evidence and the, the audience and that evidence and the topic that you're talking about to make sure that there's a secure connection there. So when we talk about reasoning, we have a variety of different types of reasoning. Uh, one is cause to effect, cause to effect. So that, that one thing causes the effect of another. So one classic example is we know that, you know, that we don't have to, go too, hard, too far to, to explain to people that smoking causes uh, lung damage and causes cancer and so forth, right? We know this scientifically. So we start with the, with, with the action, smoking cigarettes or smoking, whatever, and we can then proceed to the effect because uh, this person smokes cigarettes. They are more likely to have lung damage and to have health issues in that arena, right? So that's cause to effect. We can also flip it around and go the other direction. We can start with the effect and go to cause in the, uh, the recent impeachment trial, the second impeachment trial for president Trump, uh, regarding the, the Capitol riots and the Capitol insurrection, um, the, the prosecution, the, of, from the house of representatives started with the effects. They showed this really compelling video and, and which really walked through the days of the effects of, of the people, you know, rioting and storming the castle and attacking police and so forth, searching out for public figures and it, presumptively, presumptively to, to do them harm and things. So they started with the effect. They said, this is what happened. This was the result. And then they went backwards and said, okay, now why did this happen? And they went through months of, you know, president Trump said this and president Trump implied this and met with this person. And then on that day at the ellipses, he, he gave the speech and said these things. And he said, fight so many times. And this is why it happened. So they started with the effect and then provided the cause for that. Okay. That's another type of reasoning. So we can go cause to effect. We can also go effect to cause other times we can reason from symptoms. We can take a look at things and say, okay, this, this person is president. 
Um, so right now we have, you know, just in general, I'm just talking in general, you know, at the moment, the economy is horrible. And, and so uh, the economy is horrible and uh, we're at war with this nation and people are living below the poverty level and health is an issue and so forth. All you can give this laundry list of things that are wrong with the country and say, these symptoms are all representative of this person's leadership. And that's why this person should no longer be president. This person should no longer be senator. This no, you know, whatever it should no longer be mayor or whatever level you're talking about. So we list off all the symptoms and we reason from that. Criteria to application. Uh, this is a type of persuasion where we say, okay, what is it that people need? What is it that, you know, presumptively people need and are looking for? So for example, if you're, uh, this would be an example of if you're looking to buy a car, then this, this advertisement is laying out, this is what you need. You know, this is, these are the criteria you should be using to apply what you're looking for in a car buying experience. You should be looking for complete transparency. You should be looking for lifetime warranty. You should be looking for technology driven process. Presumably this is all things that are provided by this dealer then, right? So they're laying out the criteria that are necessary in the application of that situation. Okay. So we have that kind of reason. Another type of reasoning is reasoning from comparison. We compare things all the time, right? We, we compare, you know, when, when, uh, you know, can get an example as a politician says, well, I have a plan to fix social security. Here's my plan. Here's my opponent's plan to fix social security. Let's compare the two or my plan on the budget is this and theirs is that, right? Let's compare those two. So we reason from comparison. We compare two, two things that are presumably related, uh, ideally related. And we work from there. Then we also have two very common types of, of reasoning that we have our first reasoning from deduction, which is what our guy Aristotle did a lot. He started, you know, if we think of it like a funnel where we're starting at the top with the big idea, right? The big broad idea. And then we're narrowing it down. We're narrowing it down to a particular hypothesis and narrowing it down to specific conclusions as a result of that, right? We're working our way down that funnel. We pour the big ideas in at the top where it's widest. And then at the end, we come out with these very narrow ideas. And that's what Aristotle did very well. He was, he was, he, use deductive reasoning on many occasions uh, on many of life's large issues. So the other type of reasoning that we can have, then the kind of the flip side of this is inductive reasoning. And this is what we see when you, when you see Sherlock Holmes, for example, Sherlock Holmes is a famous example. Somebody uses inductive reasoning. Sherlock Holmes looks at all these little things, right? That he sees along, picks up little clues along the way. And from that then expands outward. So he's starting kind of the upside down funnel, right? He's starting from something very narrow, these very specific clues that, you know, at times seem disconnected seem like they're not connected at all and then from that he's able to put together a pattern or something and at the bottom then come out with this broader conclusion right that's inductive reasoning inductive reasoning okay so those are two different you know kind of famous types of reasoning deductive reasoning inductive reasoning but all different types of reasoning that we can use okay there's no shortage of inductive uh, or types of reasoning that we can use um, there's also different types of reasoning evidence. So again, different ways that we make these connections between reason and evidence, things like statistics, we use testimony, we use uh, comparisons and analogies. All of these are ways that we, we support our reasoning and, and connect it to the evidence and demonstrate the, the relationship between the two. Those are all important uh, things again, because we need to, we can't just have either reasoning or evidence and we can't just have reasoning that exists separately from the evidence or vice versa, right? We need to have reasoning and evidence that, uh, that are connected and that we can demonstrate that relationship between the two of them. There are times when our reasoning gets out of hand though. and does not make sense. People use illogical reasoning and we call these fallacies. Okay. So there, there are a variety of common logical fallacies, fallacies, again, being illogical reasoning. Uh, and so we want to avoid these things. And we also, uh, as persuaders, we need to avoid these things. And we also, as an audience then need to know how to recognize them so that we can discard those arguments from other people too, and call them out on those types of things. So, so one is called, and the first few here are in Latin, that's just how they come out, but post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after, therefore, because of. Okay. So because something happened and after something else, that means that there's a relationship between the two, which is not, again, this is illogical. It's not, it's not true, right? So you can see an example here, everybody who's been to the moon has, eats chicken, has eaten chicken. That means anybody who eats chicken goes to the moon. And we know that's not true. Just because you eat chicken does not mean you go to the moon, right? It's not, so that's a post hoc ergo prompter hoc. Just because something happened afterward does not mean there was a relationship between the two. So again, going back to the, the uh, capital insurrection, that's the argument that the president Trump would make 
that, that, that his uh, supporters would make, that just because the riot happened after his speech or after some things he said does not necessarily demonstrate a relationship between the two. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying that's that's the argument they would make, that, that just because it happened afterward does not mean you can attribute what happened to him. That's a post hoc ergo propter hoc argument, and it's illogical. Ad hominem means to attack the person. Okay, ad hominem means attacking the person instead of attacking their argument. You know, you don't like something somebody says, so you say, well, that can't be true because you're an idiot. You know, what's the connection there? There's no connection between what they said not being true and them being an idiot necessarily, right? There's no specific, you need to offer specific evidence in, in response to what they said if you're going to uh, try and negate their argument, right? You can't just attack that person, you know? Well, I, you know, I can't believe what you said about, you know, this politician said about defense spending because they have a terrible haircut. Okay, what's the connection between the two? That's an ad hominem attack. That's attacking the person instead of attacking their argument. Ad populum is what we call a bandwagon argument, a bandwagon effect. And this is also illogical. It says that just because something is popular does not mean it's true. And we know that to be the case, right? There are lots of, lots of people and lots of things that are popular, but aren't necessarily good, if you know what I'm saying, right? Aren't necessarily good at what they do. So if we don't necessarily want to jump on the bandwagon just to say, oh, well, other people think that this person or this thing is good, so I have to think that too. You know, or a lot of people say this is, this person's very popular. They sell a lot of records, so they must be good. Not necessarily. Uh, the undistributed middle. The undistributed middle means that we tend to pull people to one extreme or the other, in a sense. That, that, and we see this a lot in politics. For example, in the 2020 election, we saw a lot of, you know, President Biden, or uh, then candidate Biden is a Democrat, and so is Bernie Sanders, and they've talked, and they're, you know, they're kind of friendly. So, uh, so that means that, um, that Biden must be a socialist as well. Right. Bernie Sanders is a socialist, well-known, you know, likes to, likes these socialist ideas. And so because he is, uh, you know, friendly with, Pre with, with Biden, that must mean that Biden is a socialist as well. He can't be in the middle there. He can't be undistributed. He's got to be somewhere in the, in the connection between the two. And then finally, the straw man argument where you sort of make up a weak argument for the other side um, and then explain why it's a weak argument, even if it's not their argument specifically. And again, not to belabor this point, but in the in, in insurrection, the impeachment trial related to the insurrection, the impeachment trial of, of President Trump, his uh, his lawyers continually, continually made the argument that and stressed that there was a lack of due process involved in the situation. Right. And they kept laying that on the prosecution, that the prosecution had investigated enough, hadn't done this, had not considered due pro and followed due process. Uh, and while that may have been accurate, the fact is in an impeachment trial, due process, it's not a criminal trial. So due process does not apply in that situation. Uh, and yet they kept throwing that because they didn't have much else to rely on, I don't think. So they kept throwing that on the prosecution and saying that this, this was an illegitimate case because of a lack of due process, even though, again, due process not required to be a part of an impeachment trial. So that's a straw man argument. They, they laid this argument on them, they laid this policy on them, uh, that the other side had not demonstrated you know, an interest in or not, not laid out themselves, but they laid it out there for them because it was something that they could attack, uh, simply. So, and it gave them uh, an arena to attack. So, these are things we need to, to watch out for, to be cautious of in using as a persuader. We don't want to fall into this trap of using logical fallacies uh, as, a, as a persuader. We also want to be on the lookout for these types of things as we uh, receive persuasion from other people. Right? So, uh, again, in this video, we've, we've talked more about the logical process of persuasion, how we can use uh, logos and, and these content premises as, uh, as methods of persuasion. Again, we've talked about in another video, we've talked about psychological processes. And in the third video in this series, we'll talk about uh, cultural pr premises and how culture impacts persuasion and can be used in persuasion. But in this video, we talked about uh, logic and reasoning, right? And so logos, again, broken down into evidence and reasoning. We need to be able to provide that proof and understand what proof is and then uh, accurately and correctly apply uh, the use of evidence and reasoning in these situations in order to provide an effective persuasive argument.
If you have questions about this or anything else related to persuasion, I would be happy to chat with you about that. Just feel free to shoot me an email. I'm always happy to respond to those. In the meantime, get out there, be a responsible persuader, use those logical appeals as content premises accurately, and be on the lookout for uh, those illogical fallacies yourself, or the logical fallacies, the illogical rational uh, use of rational fallacies yourself. Okay? And happy persuading.